I'm Christopher Kendall. I'm the artistic director and conductor of what began in 1975 as the 20th Century Consort. Since it's new music, it constantly refreshes itself. And that process is one that is near and dear to not only my heart, but to the musicians of the ensemble. Dickens' Christmas Carol is internationally known and beloved by so many. And on account of that, I think it was especially challenging to figure out a way to make this fresh and new. But I think it, it works beautifully because John and Isaiah Sheffer, the wonderful librettist, derive the key narrative elements of the Christmas Carol and pulled everything else out. And then they put music back in where that had been. So the, the music contributes something that, frankly, even Dickens' own wonderful words couldn't provide in terms of drama, emotional depth. I'm John Deke. I'm a composer. I'm a contrabassist uh, for many years in the New York Philharmonic. I consider that I was uh, helped in my early life by countless ind selfless individuals as teachers. Among probably the greatest was Leonard Bernstein himself, who I idolized as a kid on television, and then later uh, was privileged to work with him as a performer and composer. He was very supportive of my compositions. Uh, also in there, John Cage was very influential uh, as a composer, and uh, numerous, numerous other people. I founded a, an international program for children called the Very Young Composers, which I started 20 years ago at the New York Philharmonic, uh, and they've been very supportive of it, but it's been a development that I have uh, pursued obsessively over the last 20 years and has now reached thousands of kids uh, worldwide in many cities across the U.S. And he wants me to slide up. And then slide down. The consort has been performing John's pieces for many years, long before we premiered uh, The Passion of Scrooge. I think the first piece of his we played was Greetings from 1984. It's a really amazing piece for violin and piano. And that became the first of a long succession of, of works of his that, that we've done. I also have conducted John's pieces, uh, orchestral pieces. I think uh, I did the Jack and the Beanstalk, a great bass concerto with the Seattle Symphony. And so we, we have a long and wonderful history. In a way, it culminated in The Passion of Scrooge because so he wrote away. that piece for us. Yeah, and you're going to move and over to the front. That'll be various here. places. Yeah, she's and, the first one. And she's going to take you places. Yeah, Ooh, I love it. And I, think, yeah. I started this piece in 1986, laid it aside, worked on it a few years later, laid it aside. And then in 96, I really began to uh, work on it full, full scale. and. I don't know how they did it. I don't. I still, to this day, I was feeding poor Bill Sharp stuff the last week. I mean, this is, you know, it's not like he's playing an etude here. He's embodying an incredibly complex set of characters. It came off unquestionably as something powerful, uh, and I give the performers full credit for that. Okay. So we're in agreement that we're cutting those three bars, sorry. Um, do I play the downbeat of two, seven, six? Yes. 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 And we'll have to make sure the bass drum does too. Okay, so Sarah, your, your last little flip thing is out there. We're not doing it, you know. James. You were I'm cutting bar two, seven, eight, four. four. Two, seven, eight. Two, seven, We're cutting. Two, seven, eight, nine. Yeah. yeah. I can end on the downbeat. Okay, I don't want to spend too much time fixing these spots now because we want to, you know, try experiencing some other. I've never felt myself separate as a composer from the performance. To this day, when I hear this piece, I'm performing it. When I composed the piece, I was performing it. And when I perform my own works, I'm composing them. The great 
20th century composer Arnold Schoenberg developed a technique that he called Sprechstemme, in which the, the vocalist, who can be a singer or an actor or actress, um, delivers the text of the piece in a half-spoken, half-sung style. So it's speak singing. And many years later, John Deke invented a technique that he called Sprechspiel, which really involves instrumentalists speaking lines. So in this wonderful piece, The Passion of Scrooge, in addition to the, the vocal soloist, the, the ten instruments in the ensemble play various roles in the, in the, in the piece. Um, and although they, they don't speak the line with their voices, they do with their instruments. So it's a wonderful way, not only of delivering the text, but of drawing the, the instrumentalists into the dramatic presentation in a way that I, I really don't know any other composer that has achieved in this way. Beautifully played, everybody. There are special challenges for the ensemble and thereby for me as the conductor of the ensemble. There's not only music going on that's often complex in its own right, but there, there are also all these other dimensions and elements that require sort of comic timing. It's almost vaudevillian in a way. So that the players and I, and especially Bill Sharp, the soloist, really have to have a, a sense of timing that is not always what you'd strictly consider musical timing. It's often theatrical or comic timing. No prisons. Well, uh, yes, but nothing. Good afternoon. Good afternoon. Good afternoon. So, we have, you know, in conventional music, uh, operas, arias, and recitatives, and the recitatives are, are a, a sort of distinctive way of delivering texts. Um, but this goes one beyond it, because it's recitative, but it's also full of, for example, sound effects. So the players are stamping their feet or creaking doors, you know, with their bows, and the percussionist is a veritable uh, sound effects man who's playing, you know, dropping tin pans and, you know, rattling chains and doing things. So the, the timing of assembling this very complex thing, which we call music drama or mini opera or whatever it is, yes. I would say really exceeds um, the challenges of putting a normal, even very difficult piece of music together. Okay, so here we go, 129. Yeah, that's but cool. This, yeah, I think that's nice. It's Robin okay. Russo. And there's... Good. So Daniel and Rachel and, and, uh, and James, we'll just keep going. And, and uh, Lee, we'll just keep going, even if, uh, Paul, okay. even if Paul takes time in that bar. So most of the time is, you know, in the middle of the bar, really, I think. Sure, sure, yeah, okay. Yeah. Okay, that'll be good. Let's start now at scene three, two, 221. The miraculous players of the now 21st century consort, brought to life by Christopher Kendall, embody these parts as physical people. So actually when, when they play, and this is important I think, they play as great as any player I've ever heard, ever. They're, they're world-class players. Okay, 
but they also people know this I mean when you're when you're playing a piece of music you are not only a technician or even a, a very musical person or whatever you are an actor actress on stage in front of people and you have to embody that piece and these guys do it Yeah, right. So you can take your time and hey, ho, 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 And then where you stop, I'll go. Ba -da -dum, bum, bum, ba -da -dum. Oh, so just like you got half down? Yeah. Okay. And right when you get to the end of it, I'll go. Ba -da -dum, bum, bum. And I will just come in by myself at 275. Is that well, I'll give the damn beat. Okay. Ba -dum, bum, bum, if that's okay with you. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. And, and James, um, the other weird spot is uh, 266. He goes, ha, you are a giant. And giant is the second B. Okay. So I'll give it to you, but you don't really get much preparation. Ha, he goes, ha, you are a giant. And that's your it You're is. right. So you guys come off on R, right? Ha, you off. No, no, no. He moved it. Okay, we're, so tell yeah, us how it should be. Based on the downbeat, and then we're off. Okay, just an eighth, regardless of how long he holds ha. So you just end the note. Okay, that, that, that works, that's fine. So Sarah and Paul, you guys are off on the downbeat, and the strings hold just an eighth note into the next bar and then cut off. I think it's in the character of John's music that ideally you're really there when it's happening because it, it's so engaging that the, the members of the audience really become in a way part of the performance. It's, it, it becomes a tremendously intimate kind of a connection that develops among the, the audience and the performers. So rendering a work like that in some mediated form is really challenging. So our first attempt was to do an audio recording, which we did, and, and we, we love it. This is the 20th anniversary of the premiere of A Passion of Scrooge. And during that 20 years, so often audience uh, members have come up and said, surely you're, you'll, you'll film this piece, won't you? And of course, we thought it was a great idea, but we really never could figure out how to do it until we had this wonderful encounter with uh, filmmaker Paul Moon, who actually was making this marvelous documentary about Samuel Barber and used a performance of ours with baritone Bill Sharp, who is Scrooge, uh, doing Barber's uh, Dover Beach. So through that experience, we got to know Paul, who's a consummate artist and filmmaker, and finally had a partner for doing this project of, of making a film of The Passion of Scrooge. So in doing a film of the piece, we have an opportunity to put a lot of that back in. I mean, first of all, most obviously, it's the visual, not only in the, 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 the singer soloist, but among the, the ensemble who are playing roles in the piece. Business. Tiny Tim, Tiny Tim. See how Cratchit holds his little withered body close to him, as if, as if he feared. Spirit, tell me, tell me if Tiny Tim will live. Dickens was not an artist apart. He was anything but an ivory tower artist, writer, novelist. 
He was smack dab in the middle of one of the most important social movements of his time, in other words, English boarding schools, for one thing, just many things that Dickens got involved in. He actually helped to change the atmosphere in Britain that allowed these horrible torture chambers of British boarding schools. He exposed them. But he happened to also be a great artist and could put it in a work of art that would completely subsume the reader into what he was trying to put across. He was a campaigner for social progress. Is this performance of Scrooge, is the piece of Scrooge trying to make a political point? I think it makes a very personal point. It's not as much about avarice as it is about unthinking, unfeeling, uncaring human beings being transformed by caring, by, by compassion, by, by empathy which Scrooge had because he was human. See, if we would paint Scrooge and leave him as this kind of cardboard, nasty, money-grubbing character, that, wouldn't, that would not interest me. I would be interested in how, how he could find within himself, and he did, he did, he found it within himself to reach a compassionate nature. This is not, he's not going to, I mean, it's great to go to church. I go to church myself. But he didn't find it because some minister told him, you must do this or you'll go to hell. He found it within himself because he realized that he was not revealing something in himself that was important. As Marley says, compassion, mercy, mercy was my business. The dealings of my trade were but a drop of water in the comprehensive ocean of my existence. Mercy was my business. Charity, benevolence, kindness, love, and mercy. The beauty of all life were all, were all, were all, all, all my business. The dealings of my trade were but a drop of water in the comprehensive ocean of my business. Scrooge clearly lived his life against that maxim and yet found it within himself. Nobody forced him to do this. That I find interesting. Scrooge talks a lot about Christmas, it's true. It is, it is true. There's a beautiful spirit of, of the Christmas celebration, but it is totally universal. My librettist is, uh, Isaiah Sheffer, Jewish, but he found something profound in this story that, that, uh, that transcends any sect, any religion.
I never intended for this work to be personal. As I say, I didn't understand it. I thought it was about some old penny pincher uh, turning generous or something like that. I did not expect it to, to rattle the very bones of my soul, and it did. Somewhere in the middle of the piece, I, I just, I kept breaking down crying writing this piece. I, and I didn't know why until later. I was going through probably the, most, the roughest period of my life. A family breakup, trying to get back together, um, a real problem with both my parents who were suffering at that time. I mean, it was a horrible, I was a horrible hell of a time for me. And it was only later that I realized that I was un totally unconsciously working through stuff. did play a part in the transformation of my life. It's true. What it kind of gave birth to, and you might even say a little bit of, there, there might be a symbolic uh, tiny tin in there. I became aware of the future of music, the future creation of music, and it took the form of a child. And that's what happened when I went to the Colorado Symphony, and I suddenly became aware that children were brilliant and incredibly musical already. It may have taken, may take you 20 years to learn the clarinet well enough to play in the National Symphony, but everyone has a musical brilliance that, that would allow them to compose music at a very early age. And just as proof of that, most of the popular music that we have comes from the music of children in the street. When I went to Palestine, not too many weeks ago, I said, one thing I want to get straight here. We are going, me and my teaching artist, we are going there to listen to children. We are not bringing European classical music to kids of color. We are going there to listen to the children of these countries. I think that transformation that happened to me was that, that was new. That was new to me. us. God bless us, everyone. I can't even begin to describe what those words mean. I think different people will take away different things from that. People who believe in, a, in an actual spiritual, physical God will, will feel uplifted and, and joyous as Christmas befits. But uh, I only take away the spirit of those words. I, I just... Uh, it's just a recognition of the beauty of life. And a Merry Christmas to you, my lady. It's such a change in the old man. You know, it's, it's an interesting thing as a new music group. It is really not that easy to find repertoire around the holiday season. But now that we have it, for us, it's become a staple of our repertoire and I think is, is fully worthy of becoming a staple of the repertoire, right along with The Nutcracker and The Messiah as a piece that is an inevitable part of the holiday experience. Merry 